You've probably seen big corporations falling victim to ransomware attacks, costing them hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars. Have you ever wondered how those negotiations even work? My name is Caden, and today we're diving into the process of ransomware negotiations. Initial contact. When the malware has done its part, encrypted and exfiltrated everything, the criminals behind the operation make an initial contact. In this example, we're going to use another company, a law firm that Security Scorecard jumped in to save the day for. And this particular company had put a lot of effort and money into their cybersecurity. So you'd think it'd be a little bit harder to get into their systems, right? No, it was a mere 10 minutes. The breach leveraged OSINT data. OSINT stands for Open Source Intelligence, and it's essentially the collection of data from open sources on the internet. Websites, website owners, the infrastructure they are running on, exposed sensitive data, usernames for accounts, etc. Attackers will generally leverage this data that's intended to aid investigations, law enforcement, and proactive security assessments as a means to identify vulnerabilities and potential starting points. These rapid breaches typically happen through social engineering tactics, targeting specific departments or employees, pinpointing weaknesses in software, and exploiting unpatched security vulnerabilities. Now, panic sets in for this law firm as all the operations grind to a sudden halt. The hackers didn't waste any time. Their encryption tech finished up, deleted all production data, as well as a note. Here is our telegram handle. $250,000 or you lose everything. Yeah, this wasn't going to be an easy task. Negotiations. After being in contact, negotiations start. This is where situations often become dire. It's not uncommon for hackers to put up very short and strict time limits. In our story, for example, the hackers told the firm that they had 24 hours to make the payment at the point of contact, or the ransom would only keep climbing and data would get leaked out. To get into the mindset of these hackers, you need to think of them as business people right now doing collections. Their main objective is to extract as much money as possible from these companies that they've breached. That's it. With the clock ticking, our law firm found itself stuck between a rock and a hard place. Thankfully, they had experience with Bitcoin wallets and had it ready. While a bit on the later side, they decided to reach out to our incident response folks for guidance. They felt confident in themselves, but essentially wanted some pointers and advice on how to handle this. As you'll learn soon, law firms and cyber criminals aren't too compatible. Attribution and proof of life. At one point, the breached company wants to know if they're really speaking to the right attackers and if they really have their data. This is attribution and proof of life. While some groups like to revel in notoriety, others like to lurk in the shadows. Usually if a major breach happens, there will be some sort of manifesto out there on the dark web or something pointing to an attack that has happened. Where the proof of life concept comes in is essentially proving that the company's data is in their hands. They show evidence. In some cases, to amp up pressure, they leak out a little bit of information to the public to get their victims desperate. And that's what this group did. Proof of life the hard way. When the victim decides to pay the ransom, then comes the natural doubt. You can't just take these hackers at their word, and that's what this company initially thought. The firm had to be talked out of this, but they legitimately believed that they could just send over a DocuSign and that these hackers, who have already demonstrated they don't care about breaking laws, would just follow the rules of the DocuSign and not leak any more information. I'm sorry, but what? Payment is not as easy as you'd think. It's not like sending your friend the 10 bucks you owe for pizza. And it's not because of the amount you pay or the cause you pay that money for or the Bitcoin thing, but it's because in many cases, these ransomware groups are in embargoed countries. Paying anything to an embargoed country is super illegal even if your life depends on it. The good news is that your cyber insurance often covers most of the ransom cost anyway. Good reason to have cyber insurance. After the payment of the ransom, and even with our incident response folks' assistance, the law firm is left to wonder, how can such an attack be prevented? Well, if they had worked with us before this whole ordeal, they could have been aware of their exposures on their attack surface and gotten more organized responding to the attack by running a tabletop exercise 
run by our incident responders. It's best to get your incident response partner on board on time, and not when things hit the fan. Know your attack surface and get your company prepared for such an attack with professionals who respond to attacks like this daily. As for this company, the ransom was paid and the attackers kept their word. Now, everything's off in a better place. My name is Caden, and thanks for watching. Yeah.